So hello and welcome. My name is Julia Kuo, 2007 WashU graduate, and I'm excited to welcome you to this virtual conversation about incidental representation in children's literature with myself, Sarah Park Dahlin, and Connie Shu. So before we begin, I'd like to explain the format for today's session. Your screen will feature myself and our panelists, and we ask that you keep your videos off and mics muted during this time. The discussion will last about 35 minutes. Following the conversation, we will have plenty of time for Q&A. So thank you to everyone who has already submitted questions via your registration. During the Q&A session, we'll get to as many questions as we can. This event is being recorded and we will share it on the Alumni Association YouTube channel following the event. So now it's my pleasure to introduce one of our panelists, Sarah Park Dahlin. Dr. Sarah Park Dahlin is an Associate Professor in the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign where she is also affiliate faculty in the Department of Asian American Studies and the Center for East Asian and Pacific Studies. Her research is on Asian American youth literature and transracial Korean adoption. She co-edits research on diversity in youth literature with Sonia Alejandra Rodriguez, and her, new, her next books address Asian American youth literature with Paul Lai and race in Harry Potter with Ebony Elizabeth Thomas. She co-created the Diversity in Children's Books infographics and administered Lee and Lowe's 2015 Diversity Baseline Survey. Sarah is represented by Trish Lawrence of the Aaron Murphy Literary Agency. Thank you, Julia. I'm so happy to introduce Connie Shu. Connie is the editorial director of Roaring Book Brook Press, an imprint of Macmillan Publishing, a founding member of the Children's Book Council Diversity Committee, and a member of the Brooklyn Book Festival Children's Planning Committee. Books on her list include the bestsellers Be Kind, Real Friends and Best Friends, and After the Fall. Other acclaimed books include Caldecott Medal winner, The Adventures of Beagle, Caldecott Honor book Leave Me Alone, Cybert Medal winner, Fry Bread, and graphic novels by Eisner winner, Tilly Walden. She was born in Taiwan, raised in Alabama, and now lives in Brooklyn. Hi, everyone. And I have the immense pleasure of introducing Julia Kuo, um, author of Let's Do Everything and Nothing, author and illustrator. Um, Julia Kuo is a Taiwanese American illustrator who has worked with the New York Times, Google, and Science Friday. Julia has taught illustration courses at Columbia College Chicago and at her alma mater, Washington University in St. Louis. She is the illustrator of Drawing Leaves and Trees, Observing and Sketching the Natural World, Katrina Goldsato's The Sound of Silence, Ronnie Shatter's Go Little Green Truck, Melissa Gilbert's Daisy and Josephine, 20 Ways to Draw a Dress, 20 Ways to Draw a Cat, Everyone Eats, and I Dream of Popol by Livia Blackburn. All right, it's probably time to shorten that list um, eventually. So I'm going to start off with a slideshow of books featuring incidental representation and just define the term so that we know where we're starting with. Um, so incidental representation refers to showing groups of people who have been historically marginalized in stories that don't explicitly address their culture or ethnicity. So here are some examples of books that do feature incidental representation. A Place to Grow by So Young Pak and Marcelino Trong. Jenny May is Sad by Tracy Subasak. Let Me Finish by Min Lei and Dan San Santat. Oh, Isabel Rojas for this one, right? Oh, yes. Thanks for correcting me. Oh, no worries. It's just, I was just reading the cover. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is by um, the two of them, Dan Santa and Min Lei, and that's Lyft. Milo Imagines the World by Matt De La Pena and Christian Robinson. Maimani Medicine by Edwidge Danticat and Shannon Wright. Nine Months by Miranda Paul and Jason Chin. Una by Kelly DiPuccio and Raisa Figueroa. Saturday by Oge Mora. The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats. The Umbrella by Taro Yashima. And When Aiden Became a Brother by Kyle Lukoff and Kailani Juanita. All right, so to kick off our conversation, um, you know, 
this panel was kind of started by the launch of Let's Do Everything Nothing, my new picture book with Connie at Roaring Brook. And one of my favorite things about this book is the fact that I was able to include Taiwanese American characters in a Taiwanese American home in a story that doesn't really explicitly talk about the culture or race. Um, they simply just are. So I wanted to talk to Connie about how she um, kind of came to a place where she would suggest to me that we do this. So when I first wrote the manuscript and was thinking about the dummy, I didn't really consider the idea of making it, um, putting them in a Taiwanese American home. It was Connie who suggested this idea to me. So Connie, as an editor, is this something that you are consciously doing with your writers and illustrators? Um, I'm, I kind of would love to just hear about your thought process um, if this is something that's happening on an industry-wide level, or if you are, if you know that you're one of the few editors who are trying to make this happen. Yeah, for this book in particular, uh, the way you rendered the characters, it reminded me of, of myself and my relationship with my daughter. And then I thought about my own home. And I thought about, you know, the, the side that, you know, Chinese like character signs that we hang up for good luck. And I thought about the red uh, da tong rice cookers, like <laughs> which we talked about from um, I, I Dream of Popo. And I think that was just truly more of like a instinct from the heart because um, I felt that your art is so beautiful and your the, the way you express your heritage is so beautiful. Uh, so why not? You know, why, why, why not include it and, and also show how you can have these cultural details, but love and that relationship between two people can be universal, no matter what the setting. It's, it was also because the opening scenes were these like uh, really fantastical, beautiful scenes that, that really could, could be anywhere. You know, they're not really set in a specific environment. And so your book was all about contrast, right? You know, about something majestic and magnificent, almost a, a, you know, a magical and then to the mundane and to show the mundane we had to show some snacks <laughs> why not shrimp chips right and and we had to show um a home life and a home life devoid of these details in any culture um will feel less homey and i feel like if even if someone doesn't quite know what that character is you know hanging on that sign or or the 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 rice cooker they know that this is a kitchen that is filled with cooking and a house filled with love and warmth and so for so it was a more of a personal response i see you know so i i'm really curious about kind of like this trajectory of cultural understanding and how these books are being made um i think i'd be curious to hear from both of you connie like is this something that you've been conscious of doing ever since you've become an ed editor or is this something more recent for me it's something more recent unfortunately in the past books were watered down. Mm. And that was uh, the, the term used was general appeal. We wanted to make it generally appealing. And that really, um, when, you, when you just look at the face of it, it means let's make it um, comfortable for uh, people who aren't of color, right? Like it's, it, it, it became this sort of nice way, this euphemism. And um, I think that there have been books I admittedly worked on earlier in my career, where we took out cultural details mm. in order to make and, and it was coming from booksellers and that was that feedback was being fed to our sales team and oh, our wow. sales team was expressing that to you know our acquisitions team which includes sales and marketing and publicity and then that was what editorial was hearing wow that's and so yeah so you, revealing you feel very powerless mm -hmm. in that situation because how do i on this end of the process reach the person on this end of the process and honestly and i think this is a perfect segue into what sarah does it it, it takes people outside of this linear publishing commerce process to make change because i didn't know how i could influence the bookseller here and then you have people like sarah coming from the sides <laughs> and making great change. So Sarah, I'd love, I think that's a perfect segue to, to what you're, you do and what your influence in this in the discussion is. Yeah, sure. Uh, go ahead, Julia. Yeah. 
So, you know, I think, Connie, that kind of confirms my suspicions. And I wanted to run, run kind of like this thought I had by Sarah, where I was imagining this trajectory of how these books or how media has been presented to Asian Americans. Um, okay, so bear with me. I'm kind of like gonna go down a bullet list of, of um, like a little timeline of media. And Sarah, I wanna hear your, your response to this. Sure. So I feel like originally Asians were written about by non-Asians and that's how we get these stereotypes. That's how we get these tropes. And then so the first few Asians kind of who, who did have the privilege of writing about their own stories probably bear this huge weight of, of speaking for or representing the whole group. Um, and so, you know, then we kind of start to get into more truths and more specific truths, like stories explore, exploring whole, cultural and historical legacies. Um, with these, we can affirm Asian American identities and we can educate others. Um, and then from there on, we go to incidental representation, representation books like we showed, um, where you have specific stories that don't need to speak for the group. Do you think mm -hmm. that this is like your understanding or, I mean, I feel like as a, yeah. scho a scholar, mm -hmm. you would be immersed in this. <laughs> yeah, so I, I just, I'm so glad to be here with the two of you because I think our three different like positionalities within this, you know, this children's literature industry, having conversations and learning from, from each other is just like such a great opportunity. So um, yeah, I mean, when you posed this question, I was like, wow, I, I'm, I'm writing an entire book about this. Um, so just to give you like the summary, um, when Asian Americans or Asia, sorry, let's just talk about Asians, right? When Asians first started appearing in materials for children um, around the turn of the century, it was stuff like my little cousin in Korea, my little cousin in China. And so they were over there, right? Um, and one of my research projects is about this white guy named Frank I'm um, sorry, Frank Carpenter, who traveled to like lots of different countries around the world, including countries in Asia. And he would write um, little stories about what he observed, sort of like what Clifford Geertz calls thick description, just like this is what these Asian people eat in their homes. And this is what, you know, this is what a market looks like and whatever. And he would send those back to the United States newspapers and they would be syndicated across the country. And so it was very much about the people over there. And I've looked at Frank Carpenter's archives and he rarely talks about when he was publishing in newspapers in the United States, rarely talks about Asians in the United States at the turn of the century. And we know that there were a lot of things happening like the um, 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, right? And he was writing around that time, but it's not showing up in his writings. He's more interested in the Asians over there, right? Um, and so we saw books like, uh, so the writings that he was producing, which then got published into these geography readers that were then, you know, published in school or uh, distributed to schools. We saw things like My Little Cousin in Korea. Um, and then, um, you know, in 1912, that's what we consider the first sort of Asian American like text for children, Sui Sin Far's um, Tales for Chinese Children. And she was a mixed race Asian, she was Chinese and white. And so her collection of stories is sort of like the first Asian American authored work for children in the United States. So not over there, but over here. Um, and then we have decades and decades and decades of still like white people, you know, here and there we, we get something like um, an Asian American writing, like the 1927 Gainek, The Story of a Pigeon, which won the Newbery in 1928. Um, and then in the 19... 40s, 50s, I forgot the exact date, um, uh, Jade Snow Wong published Fifth Chinese Daughter. And there's a lot of criticism about um, Jade, Jade Snow Wong's book because some people accuse her of writing for a white gaze, explaining what it's like to be a Chinese American in Chinatown in San Francisco. It's sort of like translating everything and describing everything in such detail that for a Chinese American reader, that might be very boring because you already know all this, right? But for the, the white American reader, it's still very foreign and exotic. Um, but other scholars have sort of revisited her work and, and maybe suggested instead that she was playing the game and she was playing to win. That book became very, very popular. Um, in fact, I assigned it in my Asian American Youth Literature course uh, earlier this semester. So then we have books like that in the middle of the century. And um, and then, of course, like, you know, Lawrence Yep started writing and we got, you know, the Japanese incarceration stories, but it wasn't until 1965 
when the Immigration Act uh, passed and more Asians were able to come into the United States. Um, and Min Hyung Song has a really great book called The Children of 1965 on Writing and Not Writing as an Asian American, where he says that because of that new influx of immigrants, though the children of those immigrants grew up and in the 80s, 90s, and now in the 2000s, are writing incredible, incredible literature, right? Like winning major awards and everything. Um, and I, I posit that we are also seeing that same children of 1965 in children's literature. And if you look at all the Newbery Awards that Asian Americans have won, all the Caldecotts, thank you, Connie, that like Asian Americans have won, right? Um, we're doing really well, um, but it is sort of that trajectory. And I know I'm talking a lot, but I wanna say one more thing. So I know everybody knows Redeem Sims Bishop for her um, mirrors and windows, right? Uh, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. But she also wrote a book called Shadow and Substance in 1982. And in this book, she looked at um, pub uh, children's books published in the United States between 1965 and 1980. So 15 years of publications. She looked at, I think, over 300 books, and she put them into three categories. Now, think about the time period, right? 1965 to 1980, it's the civil rights movement. She categorized these books into three groups. The first was social conscience. That was the integrationist coming to dinner stories. And the second was the melting pot, what we would call incidental representation, where you couldn't tell that it was a black family, except that the, the illustrations were colored in a little more. And her third category is called culturally conscious. And those are more like nuanced stories about black experiences in the United States. Um, and they still might be, you know, conflict driven um, with racism and things like that. But they, they, those stories tended to be told more by insiders and not outsiders. Um, and they tended to be told with more nuance. And so this group of three, the social conscience, melting pot and culturally conscious stories, this framework has been really helpful for thinking about the trajectory of African American children's books. And so I applied it in my dissertation, Michael Cart and Christine, or sorry, I should say my dissertation on Korean adoption in children's literature. And so like, how did that literature evolve over time? And then Christine Jenkins and Michael Cart applied it to LGBTQIA um, literature, um, and how that literature also evolved over, since like the 1960s. So I think what we're seeing now is that we would like to have more of the melting pot integration stories where or I'm sorry, um, incidental representation stories where we can just go scuba diving with our moms and sit, you know, underneath the stars and look at the clouds and things like that, the way your characters do, right, Julia? Well, that's amazing. I love that explanation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, Speaking of being outdoors, um, I know, Julia, when you were first working on this book, you told me that you liked, um, well, even before when we were at Andrew Mofofo, I, I learned that you're an avid rock climber. And I, I have to admit, my, my first thought was, wow, like, I, you know, um, she, <laughs> I always think of rock climbers as like, like, like super ripped, you know, and like, you know, I have the stereotype, you know, like hanging off by a thumb <laughs> off a cliff and like, you know, fearless. And, and the, your work is so beautiful mm -hmm. and delicate. I was like, how is this person all in one? Oh, look, we have layers and dimensions that, that, and so, um, and then, and then watching your Instagram and, and, and what you're able to do has been just so inspiring. Um, I have not I myself am not there yet, but maybe one day I will because I see you can do it. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I know you've mentioned before that representation, not just um, in regular everyday settings, but also in outdoor settings is really important to you. So um, I would love to hear more on that, on where that inspiration comes from and and why that it's, it's meaningful for you as someone who who has done what these two people are doing here <laughs> right some of it not all of it i'm still a little scared of the waterish activities um but maybe one day i'll do the scuba diving um so you know i i'm really fascinated by this idea of people of color in the outdoors and i think one of the main reasons is because they've kind of traditionally been kept out of the outdoors and i know that this reason is different from culture to culture um so you know because we're talking about asian americans i think that from our side um, our parents and many of their parents didn't come from wealth. 
And so, you know, as the kids of these people, we are pushed to focus our time and effort on careers that promise financial st stability and probably minimal risk taking, um, not to mention like keeping yourself out of literal physical harm. But, you know, you can't really talk about that without also saying that this exclusion comes from outside the Asian American community. So gatekeepers um, have traditionally been white male and affluent, you know, when Connie, you said like you're a imagining someone who's ripped, I was like, well, how do you know I'm not ripped? But I think that, you know, what I imagine when I think about a traditional rock climber is someone who's like tall and white and a guy. And so it's still unusual to see people of color in the outdoors or even as experts um, or belonging, you know, kind of on either end of the experience spectrum. Um, and so personally, as someone who's kind of like sought out like random rocks in the middle of nowhere, I've gone to very, you know, less, very much less Asian populated places such as Alaska, Kentucky, West Virginia. And I've experienced my fair share of um, suspicious looks and sometimes outright hostility. So, you know, rock climbing often takes me to places where I feel safer being in a group with some white people. And that's a really sad reality, but I'm aware that my existence in the outdoors can be perceived in ways that are just out of my control. Um, and I think that in the light of all these recent violent attacks on Asians, this is not something to be taken lightly. But, you know, that doesn't stop me from wanting to claim this space um, and to show that Asian Americans can be adventurers, um, even five foot tall female ones who are ripped. Um, and, uh, you know, this representation, it's not just important for Asians to see, but it's important for non-Asians to see. And I think that the bottom line is that we all need to see it to normalize it. Um, you know, for Asian kids to imagine and dream about themselves in this position, but also for non-Asian kids to, to see this as a reality. Using, uh, oh, um, go ahead. I was just saying it's uh, using incidental representation to also dispel stereotypes mm -hmm. uh, in a way that is less didactic than, you know, if you had written a book called Asians Rock Climb too, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Maybe a little less awkward. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that's a lot where craft comes in, right? Um, because, uh, you know, as I was flipping through Let's Do Everything and Nothing, and, you know, I mentioned the scuba diving scene and Connie showed it um, a little while ago, but, you know, I, so I grew up a swimmer, so I'm very much used to water. Like, oh, I don't, cool. I will not go rock climbing with you, <laughs> probably, because I'm very clumsy on my feet, but I will go swimming and I will go scuba diving and, and do all those things. But when I was looking at that, um, at the scuba diving scene, it reminded me of Tina Cho's um, The Ocean Calls, which I think is just such a, a gorgeous book that is different from yours in that it's like culturally specific because it's Korea and it's it's got a specific um, setting and characters and vocation like these these um, Henya, they're the, the Korean grandmothers who scuba dive for, for seafood in Korea. Um, so I see these connections between these books that are telling different kinds of stories, different. Um, so this is sort of like, yeah, let's, we can do all these different kinds of things. And then in the ocean calls, it's saying, and we can do this very specific thing that's very, very cool and very, very specific to Korea. So I, I like putting these two books side by side and talking about what kinds of stories they tell about Asian and Asian Americans, right? Um, but yeah, so um, I wanted to ask Julia, you know, because we had a previous and earlier conversation about I am an American Wong Kim Ark, and you shared a lot about your research process. And I imagine that for both that book, well, for that book, I know, because you shared with us, but for this book, you know, it's, it's still culturally specific, even if it's in incidental, right? And so could you share a little bit about like your research and how you decided what to include and what not to include? Um, you know, as Connie was saying, and, and as Khan in the, in, the in the comments was saying, like that, that kitchen is so familiar to us, right? Because we see like the, the bottles and the rice cooker and things like that. So can you talk a little bit about your, your research and, um, and how you decide, how you make decisions? Yeah, definitely. Also, Sarah, can I ask you to put that other children's book in the chat? Because I personally want oh, yeah. to look at it later. Okay. Yep. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, you know, it's funny that you bring that up. I, I probably could have benefited from looking at it when I was illustrating the story, because um, when I was thinking about how to make my characters look not only Asian American, but Taiwanese American, I kind of ran up into a wall. So, you know, it's, it was easy enough to show that the characters were Asian American. You know, we have these very telltale features um, of warm skin, dark hair for better or for worse, right? It's 
it's been, both been a source of joy and, and pain. Um, but I had to think pretty hard about how to code my characters as Taiwanese American. And I wasn't able to do that for the outdoors, right? So um, it's already not the norm for Asians to be in the backcountry. And if there are any visual markers, it's usually more about showing experience versus inexperience um, rather than revealing a certain cultural background, right? So like, unfortunately in the outdoors actually experience is more typically coded as white and inexperience is coded as non-white. Um, so I would like there to be more outdoor markers normalizing different cultural traits. Like um, for example, what could picnics look like for Southeast Asian American families if they were very comfortable in the outdoors? Um, what would helmets look like that would actually protect the heads of those with black hair, um, but we're actually not there yet. So I'm, I'm curious to see that side of, of our cultural experiences develop. So I actually had to use all of my cultural markers indoors. Um, it's just, it was the way that I know how to show that I'm Taiwanese American. So, you know, I really just did this by prioritizing what's true to my own experience. So the dishwashing gloves, the save takeout menus, um, the cleaver and walk. So having illustrated I Dream of Popo, um, I knew that there was already a group of people who would connect to these markers. And I actually um, recently read Jane Kuo's manuscript, a new manuscript for a book. And I saw that she actually mentions having chrysanthemum tea and oranges for a snack. And I remember when I drew that, I was like, you know, this is something I do. I don't know if other people do it. Um, but I'm just going to put it in here. And it was just so wonderful to like see that written um, in someone else's experience and knowing that other readers will, you know, will see it for themselves. So, you know, I think that there is, it's really interesting being this second generation because we all share these very specific um, markers from our parents. But I am very curious what will happen for the third and fourth generation. You know, like, will they still be here? Will they be replaced by something else? Yeah, wow. I mean, that's, um, yeah, just thinking about the third and fourth generation, like, um, so Julie, uh, Justine Larbalestier's My Sister Rosa is, I think, one of very few children's or young adult books that mentions the daughter of an adopted Korean. Um, one of her care, one of the characters in that book is the daughter of an adopted Korean, which is, you know, the next generation, right? Even though we have like 60 year old Korean adoptees now um, who could be grandparents. But, you know, I've been looking for that in children's literature, like the subsequent generations, because right now we're still seeing all of these stories of like the adoptee who just arrived and is the first of their generation. But the, rea the reality is that there are a lot of you know, people like my daughter who are the daughter of an adopted person, my husband, not me. Um, and, and what are their stories like when, you know, their, their, their parents' it, cultural experiences have been so um, particular because of their transracial adoptions, right? So yeah, um, so I, I've talked to Justine about that, like, why did you put that in there? That's kind of random. And she was like, because there are people like they're out there, which is like such a Justine answer. Like, yeah. yes, that is absolutely right. <laughs> that is that is why you should put them in there because they they exist. So, um, yeah, Connie, I was wondering, you know, just kind of going back to the earlier conversation about how um, earlier in your career you felt like you were, you know, pressured to like sort of take things out of manuscripts as opposed to putting them in. And I was wondering if you could talk more about that. Like, do you still find, um, as you kind of, you know, shared about with Julia, like that you're the one suggesting, well, why don't you add a little bit more about your own background in this book? Like our author, our BIPOC authors and um, coming to, and illustrators coming to you sort of like thinking that they have to make their manuscripts palatable for a white gaze. And you're the one that's like, no, 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 let's let's shake things up. So can you just talk a little bit more about that? I think it's changed dramatically recently. And that's so wonderful to see. And I think it's because when publishers, through the encouragement of influencers, educators, gatekeepers, mm -hmm. um, started publishing uh, books that were or had, you know, or more inclusive. Um, we're less afraid to lean into an identity, lean into mm -hmm. a character in that way um, and, and represent them authentically. And lo and behold, those books sold. Those books ended up selling because there was a market hungry for it. There was a market just um, filled with too many books that have been whitewashed and um, made generic. And so there was a, a, a growing hunger for it. And 
finally, I think publishers began waking up and, you know, it's a business and so money talks. And so um, now it's a lot easier to make a case at our acquisitions meeting because we have, um, the, you know, examples to point to in the marketplace, but it started with people who push the agenda hard enough in order to bring these books to market. And so I think that it was a collective effort that's been happening for decades. As you point out, your research extends back, mm -hmm. you know, over a century ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So now it's almost the uh, opposite where I'm beginning to see books that are not necessarily incidental representation, but just a representation, a slight, like here's an um, BIPOC author who has written a very uh, light narrative that briefly touches on being from that background. Mm -hmm. Now, now go sell it, you know, and, and so it's it sort of take taken sort of the the intention out of these stories. And so, you know, right now I'm actually a flush with like any book written by an Asian author, like almost like, you know, that's why I feel like when, when I look at my submission list and I feel I feel uh, some kind of way about it. On the one hand, I'm glad that agents are seeing opportunity with, um, you know, uh, authors of color very exciting. I love seeing books like, you know, um, you know, Eyes That Kiss in the Corners and I Am Golden, like these books celebrating Asian um, identity, you know, become these comps, these comparative titles that publishers can point to. But on the other hand, you know, it's just sometimes it feels really opportunistic. Mm. And so that hmm. that kind of is, is, is and, and also, you know, I don't do a lot, any why a fantasy for instance and for a while i was getting a lot of those on submission by asian authors with asian you know themed stories and i was thinking oh i just now i feel you know uh, you, uh, like you're only looking at who i am and not what i do yeah if that makes sense <laughs> so yeah. um but but in in short um i do see that the um, books featuring Asian American content has risen a lot. We have more to point to, and mm -hmm. there's no reason why we can't be doing more. But also to your point about the child of a Korean adoptee experience, like let us move away from purely immigration stories. Let us move mm -hmm. away from purely identity stories. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I think that part of that is what Julia is doing, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, having showing um, Asian uh, characters in, in everyday settings and settings that you don't normally see them without it being a messagey book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to ask about um, a trend that Reading Well White had pointed out in 2019 um, in one of their blog entries. And they had observed, and um, several people had observed, and so they ended up writing a blog post about it, but they had observed a trend where um, white writers were being paired with BIPOC illustrators. And so I was wondering if you're having conversations among your peers about that, because on the one hand, it's an opportunity, right, for a BIPOC illustrator. Um, and, it, and it can lend you know, to this idea of incidental representation where, yeah, the person could just be doing anything um, every day, doing, you know, doing everything and nothing. Um, to, but yeah, I was just wondering if if you have thought about it and if you and your peers have been talking about that. Yes, that is something I have seen as well. And mm -hmm. um, I, I, I do feel like um, when that white author is writing about an Asian character, it sometimes mm -hmm. has felt like they're trying to buy authenticity um, mm -hmm. or the, uh, you know, that 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 pairing um, feels more opportunistic than organic and creative. So, mm -hmm. so, the, the, so um, I do acknowledge that I've seen that happen. Um, and then, yes, there are um, there, there has been that trend because I feel like in response to books getting more attention because there is a BIPOC creator attached. Um, it becomes sort of a marketing promotional, yeah. um, uh, you know, point of uh, perspective on it, which is also mm -hmm. uncomfortable. 
Um, and so mm -hmm. that's why I think having more people working in publishing on all levels from marketing, mm -hmm. publicity, sales, and editorial uh, being involved helps because we can point to that and say, that's kind of uncomfortable. And I'm not sure about that approach. And to, um, and, and the only way you can bring up some of those concerns is by moving up to within those companies. You know, somebody a year or two in may not feel comfortable speaking out, um, you know, uh, on a project that uh, somebody 10 years in is working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. yeah, and I think one more thing I'll say about that is that, um, you know, C, sorry, the CCBC, not the CCB, they publish those, those statistics every year, right, about the um, diversity in publishing. And when a white writer is paired with an Asian American illustrator, and that book gets tagged then as an Asian American book, because the Asian American illustrator has like, you know, created Asian American characters, even if the text doesn't say anything about them being Asian American, like that increases the numbers for Asian Americans. And multiple times throughout the past decade, we have been our, our group, Asian Americans, um, our uh, by number has been larger than our about number. Um, and so that's that's a conversation that I think like we have to have as a family um, because I, you know and Asian Americans can write these incidental representation books and we can create books about seals and pregnancy and you know all, like the books that we shared earlier um, and I think it's about balance right because um, you know in, in library science we talk about an individual book evaluating it it's on, on its own merit and then also evaluating it as part of a larger collection. And when particular types of stories dominate, where maybe like the Asianness is completely stripped out, which is absolutely not the case in Let's Do Everything and Nothing, um, then what does that communicate about the particularity of, of being Asian American, right? So, yeah. yeah. It makes you question, you know, even if this isn't something that was explicitly discussed or thought about, it mm -hmm. does make you question what were the thoughts behind pairing this illustrator with this author with mm -hmm. what were the, the mm -hmm. it makes you question why do they choose to represent a certain family this way if uh, you know uh, uh, it's not explicit that an uh, say an Asian character is is in the mm -hmm. story um, mm -hmm. and, and going back to the I'm American book you've got you know um, Martha Brockenborough uh, oh, a very experienced white author um, who's working in tandem with Graceland and with you, Julia. And that, I, I, I like that approach very much because mm -hmm. oftentimes there are writers who say, well, it's not my story and I can't write it. And it's like, that's not where the conversation ends. Yeah. You can work as a team and you'll learn from each mm -hmm. other through the process. So Julia, I actually would love for you to talk a little bit about that too, about you know when, how, how you pair your talents when somebody who is, you know, in that kind of team collaborative because i saw that book and i thought that was really cool that you guys did that yeah i mean i was thinking about it while you were talking while you two were talking and i was thinking like i don't think it fits quite into either category that we're you know that we're speaking of yeah. and i have to admit that when i saw this manuscript for the very first time i saw martha brockenbro's name and i didn't know her and then i saw grace's lynn grace lynn's name and i was like oh okay <laughs> And it was, you know, it would have been so different if Grace wasn't on that book. And I, I have since heard about the situation under which it was created. It was more like it's, I think it's specifically Mar written by Martha with Grace. Um, and it's because Grace was more of a consultant. And you can see Martha trying to do, I mean, for lack of better words, do what's right. She wanted to bring in, in someone who had authority on it. She asked Grace how, she, how this should be represented. And I think that there was a lot of like passing over the, of the manuscript to Grace to look at and to make comments on. And, you know, then we have the editorial team led by Alvina Ling, um, who is, you know, an expert at creating these stories. And I felt very comfortable with the story because of that. Um, I was also given a lot of freedom, you know, to craft and depict the story the way that I wanted and the, the, to the best of my ability, given resources like a fact checker who could help me create this world that I personally didn't know firsthand. Um, and so I think it was probably one of the, the best experiences I could have asked for. 
in writing a book that was made by a white author about the Asian experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, so I've been on another book, The Sound of Silence, it was written by Katrina Godseto, and she's half white, half Japanese, and it's a boy, about a little boy in Tokyo. And I felt like I could draw this book because I was, I had gone to Japan a couple times before, but in retrospect, I think that I was a little overconfident and that there probably could have been better illustrators to tell the story. Um, and I, I think that there is, you know, so as the illustrator, there is some responsibility for how do I, um, how much ownership am I allowed to take? And, you know, even if it's, you know, this is business, this is my work and this is my livelihood, um, but can I, can I tell this story in an authentic way? And, you know, I think that there's a lot of these questions about, can we tell other people's stories? Um, and I think that, you know, rather than saying like a blanket hard no or, you know, a blanket yes, I think the answer is if you dare, because a lot of times the story reflects on you more than what you produce. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's something I kind of carry going forward. Um, like I am constantly thinking about what, what I know, what my authority is and what I can learn about and what I can learn about in a, in a genuine, honest way. Um, so I think it's kind of a, a work in progress. For sure, for sure. And, and bringing up like, um, you know, when you, as we we're talking about Grace Lynn, um, I, I think an Alvina, and one of the first books that I, I read from Little Brown when I started, I, I started my career working as Alvina's assistant. And um, I remember seeing the year of the dog, it was the year the year of the dog came out and I have to, I'm gonna share, share. And so this is on topic a little bit for adjacent to what we're talking about in incidental re, uh, uh, like representation in that there are themes about um, Pacey's identity, the main character's name Pacey in this book, but the, the major themes are about a child who moves to a new town and is learning to make friends. And so I'd love to get your thoughts a little bit on like how, whether or not this book would fit, you know, especially when you were talking about Sarah, the melting pot mm -hmm. versus the, you know, how, how would you, you know, of course, when a book is longer than a picture book, it's a little harder to like not touch on <laughs> some yeah. of these, um, you know, mm -hmm. cultural details, but I, I'd love your thoughts on if this would fit mm -hmm. into, if someone were to ask you, mm -hmm. does this book fit incidental representation? What would you say? I would say absolutely not because this book is much longer um, and has so much more room, right? To explore um, just a lot of different topics. And, and when I think about like, my daughter actually is in a book club with um, librarian Sam Bloom's daughter and we're reading the Year of the Dog series. <laughs> and so like, we're, yeah, it's, it's great. Um, but you know, like when she talks about things like a classmate says to her, you can't be Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz play because there's no such thing as a Chinese or a Taiwanese Dorothy. Like that to me is not incidental, right? That is racist. Um, and, and, and so the fact that she brings in those kinds of conversations um, makes, to me, makes it not incidental as well as just the way throughout the entire story, her family background, her culture, um, the things that she and Melody, who's Alvina, um, have in common, a lot of them have to do with being Taiwanese. Um, and it's not on a surface level, it's not the five Fs of like food, festivities, folklore, um, famous people and fashion. It's not just that, but it's really about how the family operates day to day, you know? And so this to me is just, is like a really tender um, and beautifully written, um, what I would call in terms of Dr. Uh, Rudine Sims Bishop, like a, cult, a more culturally conscious story where it takes these cultural um, uh, characteristics into consideration and makes like a beautiful storyline out of them. So yeah, I, th this book, the Silla Lee Jenkins books, like I, no, like to me, they're not incidental. They're, they're, they don't drive the plot, but they are a rich part of the plot. Well, and, and then my other question is, and this is just for my own curiosity, and then we have to get to Q&A, so I'm like, I'm supposed to watch the time and I'm running it over myself, but I'm curious um, whether or not then can you have incidental representation in a longer form work that reflects mm -hmm. a realistic point of uh, perspective for a character? Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Okay, so you cut out a little bit. Are you asking if, um, if it would work in a longer form book? Yes, a and be authentic. Mm -hmm. A re authentic yeah. uh, representation of yeah. uh, an actual child's yeah. experience. Yeah. 
So I sort of have two thoughts in my head <clears throat> in my head right now. And the first is I think Meredith Ireland's new book, The Jasmine Project, is sort of a good example of that. Uh, Meredith Ireland um, identifies as an adopted Korean. If you go onto the We Need Diverse Books website, you'll find an article or a blog post that she, um, an interview, where she talks about The Jasmine Project and how she wanted to write a book that featured an adopted Korean, but it wasn't driven by her adoptiveness, even though that's like a very um, salient part of Mer Meredith Ireland's own identity. Um, and so in this book, um, there are, you know, the, the plot is that like, uh, Jasmine's family wants her to have a good boyfriend because like the one that she just broke up with is not such a cool guy. Um, and so that drives the entire story and it's a lot of fun to read. It's a great book, but it's not, it doesn't engage with her being adopted. Um, and, and that's okay because adoptees don't all engage with being adopted at various points in their life. Um, a lot of adoptees actually start to engage more with it when they, um, like later when in college, when they're like separated from their um, adoptive families and they're living independently for the first time or when they get married and have, and have children or start thinking about having a family. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's normal. It's, it, it, you know, um, the, you know, going back to what I said before about collections, right? Like how does this book exist in a collection? Um, and so if all the books that existed about Korean adoption were not about adopt being adopted and the tremendous issues that do come with it for many adopted people, that's a problem. But to have like a few here or there where it's like, my problem is that my boyfriend was a jerk and I need a new one, um, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I had another thought. The other thought was um, connecting to that was Viet, uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen's um, narrative plenitude and narrative scarcity theory, which he writes about in the book, Nothing Ever Dies. And he also writes about in an article in the New York Times about the movie Crazy Rich Asians. And when he, and I know we're going over time, sorry, but the idea of narrative scarcity is that there are so few representations that we rely really heavily on the few that exist, right? Like they're burdened to represent like everything that we, we want them to be so much. Um, and white people are in a state of narrative plenitude. They can have terrible rom-com rom -com movies because there are so many representations of white people falling in love, but we don't get a whole lot of that, right? And so when Crazy Rich Asians came out and then the year after when Always Be My Navy came out, we were like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is the best thing ever, even though Crazy Rich Asians was just kind of run of the mill in a lot of ways, right? Um, but, you know, we think about his theory in light of, in, in, you know, in children's literature. And I would say that even as we are, we have a lot of really great authors and illustrators winning major awards, we are still in a relative state of narrative scarcity. And so we still want our books, the few that exist, to do so much. And we, you know, my colleagues and I talk about, is it fair? Is it fair to expect every book to do X, Y, and Z when really it just wants to do X, but we don't have enough X's and we don't have enough Y's and we don't have enough Z's. And it's gonna take time to get there and we're on the right path, but we still, we still need to get there. Um, and the other thing he says about it is that we don't control the means of production, right? Um, other people are still telling our stories or still making decisions about telling our stories. So Connie, what you said about like, you know, the lack of diversity in publishing. If we had more Asian Americans in publishing, then we would probably see a lot more books. So, so we've got some recruiting and retaining to do, right? Absolutely. I look at my mm -hmm. own list and I, I see, I see a difference. And so, um, mm -hmm. well, this, this kind of segues nicely into our Q and A session, because we've got, um, the first question here from, um, someone who sent it in advance that kind of touches on, um, you know, representation. Um, so I'll just read out loud. While I absolutely believe in strong representation in children's literature, I sometimes feel as though my face or my culture is depicted in a way as if I'm on display in a museum. How do you suggest writers and readers can balance being seen um, with being objectified or commodified? You know, when I, when I read this question, I was wondering what examples they were referring to. So, you know, feel free if you're, if you're listening. But actually my, my first thought went to kind of a positive example of a face being displayed. Um, and that was, you know, Isaac is in the corner and also I am golden, 
books that really sell like really focus on how exactly we look um, and kind of celebrate that. And I, I can see why that those books have enjoyed kind of immense popularity right now. This, they really speak to the moment. Um, you know, Asians are being attacked purely based on how they look. And I can understand why we need to reframe that conversation about how we look and just yell that we are beautiful and worthy. Um, but, you know, I think that this question is probably more about being ex exoticized um, or tokenized. And, um, you know, I think that gets a lot to who the creator is. Um, mm -hmm. My suspicion would be that it's a non-Asian creator telling the story of Asian people and um, maybe being representing them for the wrong reasons, kind of like how we've alluded to. And so I think the answer is simply to have more Asian creators telling firsthand experiences that feel truthful. And, um, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. No, I was just gonna say, like, I think it's, you know, about like Dr. Sims Bishop's theory of like uh, the um, social conscience integrationist, you know, those books were very much like, hey, a black family moved into the neighborhood, let me show you how human they are. Um, and so I think stories like this um, are probably, hey, look at this Asian person. This is what an Asian person wears and eats and, you know, and this is what their face looks like. Um, and speaking of faces, I just want to say, like, I am golden. Those eyes are really slanted. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Well, I, I will also add that I, while I appreciate books like I Sat Kissed in the Corners, and I know that I, I'm glad this book exists. It is not a book that I, I would prefer to have in my home. And the difference is, is my own um, feelings about um, a book representing my heritage being sort of filtered through a physical trait. Mm. Um, and so I, 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 I know that this book has been incredibly meaningful to so many people mm. and the illustrations are just so beautiful. But it's stunning. Mm -hmm. But to your, to your point, Sarah, it, it just goes to show we need all kinds of books with all mm -hmm. kinds of, um, you know, stories and representations and themes that aren't just about the way someone looks or who they are, or you just, if you have more then that you, you, yeah. you, you, you no longer point to a hand, small handful and say, this is what represents an, an AAPI book. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all right. We're all sharing <clears throat> things now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. All right, so a second question <laughs> is, um, recently there have been a spate of books centered on various Asian folk tales or mythology. I'd like to see more books written about the immigrant experience and their new American lives and cross-cultural similarities and differences. Grandfather's Journey is one good example of that kind of book, as are others written and illustrated by Alan Say, or are those the exception? Also, I'd love to see more books about third and fourth generation Asian Americans and their experiences. So I, I reread Grandfather's Journey after seeing this question. And, um, it, you know, I think in the text, like you can see it, it's a little dated. I think at one point they say like yellow people, I see yellow yeah, people, I see yellow red and people. red. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but by the end of the book, I was like, this sounds familiar. This sounds like a book mm -hmm. I just pitched to Connie. <laughs> um, you know, and ultimately that book is about, so grandfather's journey he misses his homes wherever he goes and um that's a little similar to to home is a wish um oh it's blurred yeah home is a wish and that like you know immigrants have so many homes um whether it's ones we lived in or ones we visited or familial or like ancestral homes and so there is kind of this feeling of um bittersweet you know um just like missing all of them, no matter where you go. So it was it was eerie to realize that I'm kind of doing like a modern rendition of that. But I just wanted to say that there's so many, um, I mean, I think there's so many books to answer this question um, about like the immigrant experience, like Italians, the paper boat. Um, and then you have books being written by um, second generation that are, um, you know, that refer to our cu culture without really, you know, like, it uses a kaiju and it doesn't explain what it is. Um, it simply is. And then you have books written by, um, like we're talking about like the next generation of adoptees or um, mixed children. So Andy Chow Musser is a, um, he's half Asian, half white. And he's writing books that um, aren't explicitly about Asian American experiences because he didn't have them firsthand. 
um, but he nods to his own culture through his books. Um, and so I, yeah, I think that there are, there are, there are so many. Yeah, I, you know, what you, um, I, I really appreciate that this person called, um, specifically said grandfather's journey and that you talked about it too, because this line, the funny thing is the moment I am in one country, I am homesick for the other. That just gets to me every time. Um, you know, I, I was born in Korea, but brought to the United States by my parents when I was four months old, but my maternal grandparents um, still resided in Korea. And I used to go every, you know, every summer or they would come. And, um, and so I, I feel very at home in Korea. And so when I read this line, it just, it like grabbed me in such a particular way. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I, I totally agree that I want to see, you know, as we said earlier, more third and fourth generation um, stories. Um, personally, I would, though we continue to have immigration to the United States from Asia, um, I would like to see fewer stories because I'm afraid of the way they perpetuate the forever foreigner stereotype, right? And an example is in Jin Lan Yang's American Born Chinese at the beginning, one of the characters, Jin Lang, he comes, he moves from San Francisco to this new suburb and his teacher introduces him as, here's our new student, Jin Wang. He just moved here from China, you know? And, and to me that like captures this misunderstanding that we are not from here, that we don't belong here. And this is what fuels the anti-Asian stereotypes that we see today, uh, or the anti-Asian, you know, racism that we see today, because people don't see us as Americans, right? Um, and so I would like to see a lot more diversity in our immigration statuses, including undocumented Asians, right? Because there are a lot, actually. And one of the reasons why the DREAM Act came about was because an undocumented, I think, Chinese student in Chicago. Um, and a lot of people don't know that because um, undocumented status has been so tied to South America, right? Um, and to Mexico and, and other countries that are not, a, not in Asia. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I just think more. We just need a lot more of everything, including fantasy and superhero comics um, and yeah, different migration patterns and deeper, longer histories of migration patterns, right? Like I love Maisie Chen. Uh, Maisie Chen's Last Chance by Lisa Yi, because that goes back multiple generations, right? It's true. Um, and that's uh, representative of the author's experience as well, which is why it's important for these stories to be yeah. told by those with that lived experience. Um, well, we have a couple of great questions in the chat. I might bounce yeah. over to those. Um, and um, we, we we're gonna do two more questions and then we're gonna wrap up. We were given to go ahead to go over a little bit by a couple of minutes. So, um, so um, someone asked, I like uh, Lauren Lipcott Dale, I will name you and now I know who you are. I like the idea of collections of books having power that's different from the narrative power of an individual book. Could you talk a little bit about how you curate the collection of books you have in your own homes for your own children? How do you think about the balance of windows and mirrors the balance among books featuring incidental diversity versus being specifically about identity, race, and racism? It's a big question. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> he just buys lots of books. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I've been in this game for 20 years and, you know, like I, you, you just, you you acquire books, right? I mean, when I, I did not have a single, okay, I lied, sorry. In the year of the born Jackie Robinson and Claudia Kishi, those were the two Asian American representations I had when I was a kid. And whenever I give presentations, I talk about how like, I, I can't believe how, what my daughter has available to her today. And I'm a Asian American children's book scholar. And so we have shelves, like multiple shelves. So I don't think I'm like the right person to answer parts of this question because my daughter has exposure to so many different aspects of being Asian and Asian American. Um, and I wish that for all children. I really, really do. Um, and you know, she's got historical novels and contemporary novels. Um, but I will say, so not specifically for Asian American, but this is something I talked about um, uh, in, a, in a talk I gave last year. Um, I do not have the Little House series in my house. There's no way that I would have those books in my house, but I do have books like Fry Bread, right? And I do have books like We Are Grateful, and I do have books like Bow Wow Pow Wow, and I have Louise Erdrich's, um, you know, the Birch Bark House series, because I want my daughter 
to be exposed to those stories first. She will probably encounter Little House when she's older, but if her first exposure to Indigenous people is from the voices of Indigenous people, when she gets to the Little House, she's going to know that that's wrong, and she's going to be disgusted by some of the lines in that book, right? And so, you know, for other people who are, you know, thank you very much for trying to proactively curate um, your, your children, your home collection. But I would say, make sure to collect as many books that have been vetted by Asian Americans or by the communities that the books represent um, first, right? And if there are any concerns, then do some research on that book and see whether those concerns hold water or if that's an outlier. Um, if it's a universally loved book, then, you know, uh, then I would say go ahead and collect it um, and, and point out those books and read them over and over with your kids, um, suggest them, gift them. Yeah. Um, that's a great response. And now I'm going to go look at my shelves and think about what I exposed my child to before she you know, you know, starts reading and choosing books for herself. I will also say that there's something that I've noticed that I do is that when I take my kid to a library or a bookstore, I have a tendency to kind of guide her towards what I think she should be yeah. reading. And so I think that uh, for me, what I'm trying to learn to do is to step back and let her choose. And after it's so she hard. Yes, yeah, so we can talk about it. I can flip through it right there, especially for yeah. picture books. And then we yeah. can have a discussion. And there are times I have come home with books that I normally would not have picked up, but I, I want her to feel empowered. And I also don't want my yeah. own, you know, point of view to guide her as well. Um, yeah. And then um, lastly, uh, La question from um, Destiny W. Um, this is a great question to end on. Do you think there is an expectation mm -hmm. among publishers or other authors for BIPOC authors to be exceptional or to have a special story to tell, which limits the stories that get published and perpetuates this narrative scarcity? Oh, such a good question. <laughs> this is a great question. <laughs> I think I feel the weight of all the stories that need to be told. For example, like I'm an affluent East Asian woman. And I think about how like I don't read that many books written by Southeast Asians. And it makes me wonder what space my book is taking up when perhaps another convenience place. I was actually talking about this to a bookseller as I've been kind of making around signing books. And she looked at me very sternly and she said, there's enough space. Um, there is enough space and you never know who needs to hear what story. And I think that that's something that kind of really touched me and um, kind of helped to take some of the pressure off um, because, you know, I think that it's not just, there's so much, this pipeline, there's a pipeline for a reason, you know, and books get vetted as they're being created. And at this moment, I, I really trust, I really trust it. Like I trust mm -hmm. the process and I, um, and I know that if I create a story that's not really the right story for the moment, or maybe it's not the best to be told, I, I don't really think that it'll go through because of mm -hmm. editors like Connie and my agent who are, mm -hmm. who are really working, like they spend their days working on making sure that it is quality coming out. Yeah. And you know, I, I really struggle with this right now because, you know, I'm working on my first picture book and I would say it falls into the exceptional category, um, the exceptional not in terms of quality, but like the story itself is sort of like quite unique. Um, and it's, you know, I think about how this is also the story that's going to get me to the next story, which is, I think, very different um, and probably would not be the first story that would be successful for me. You know, um, we can talk about this later offline. <laughs> There's so much, there's so much there to think about, you know, the, the narrative, like the destiny said about narrative scarcity, we, we, and I think we've been conditioned, right, to think that there's only so much space, but we have to think long game, you know, is this book going to get me to the next book? And what, what's the next book going to do? What's the third book? What's the fourth book going to do, right? And what are those stories that need to be told as well? And then I really like what Julia said, like, you don't know who needs to hear this story right now. Yeah, and from the publisher point of view, the answer is there is uh, expectation, 100%. Like the same thing that made us, you know, um, 
turns distinctive stories into generic stories, that same pressure, that same pressure is still there. It's just now funneled differently. And now it is, if you're a black author, you write stories about black pain. If you're an Asian author, you write stories about immigration. Like there is the stereotype that people fall into. Um, there is this um, need to point to something that has already worked in the marketplace and then say, do 10 more. This happens across mm -hmm. many, many uh, industries, mm -hmm. right? And that, and, and it affects publishing too. So the, the, um, I, I feel like the only way we can do that is to push books, like let's do everything and nothing and to try to think out of the box. And sometimes no one mm -hmm. will buy them and sometimes mm -hmm. people will. So yeah. that's, that's, it's just a risk that publishers have to take, authors have to take, artists mm -hmm. have to take, mm -hmm. and then we need people like Sarah to talk them up. <laughs> <laughs> On it. <laughs> yeah. um, this and I, been, oh, go ahead. I think we're, I, I was going to say, I think we're well over time, so we probably should wrap up. <laughs> we could go on forever. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This was so illuminating. I can see there's a couple of comments mm -hmm. that are just saying, like, thank you for this conversation. And I just wanted to say thank you to Sarah and Connie. Like, I, I think I learned so much and I have some books to look up now. Um, so mm -hmm. I will formally close this out by saying thank you for joining us for today's event. Um, stay tuned for more events coming up through the WashU Alumni Association. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.